about six or seven years ago, small group of people. Uh, we have about 100 members, about 40 of us are really active. Um, and we are delighted to have you here today, and I hope you enjoy the show. I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the festival. Uh, John comes from Denver. He flew all the way out here yesterday to be with us. Uh, he is a fellow that went to school at Humboldt State and then got graduate degrees at Davis, both in botany and plant pathology. However, he's never earned his living doing that, according to John. He earns more money doing something else, but he's had a lifelong interest in mycology. And for over 40 years, he's traveled around the country doing talks like this and leading hikes to share his interest and love of mushrooms with those of you who are just tuning in to the fascinating world of mycology. Um, so, without further ado, I would like to have John give Hi. you some good, good advice. Thanks, John. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. So, what this talk is really about is what are the things you need to know if you want to learn how to identify mushrooms? And mostly you'll want to get a book, you know, a good field guide, and we've got a couple of good ones, we'll talk about those. Um, but what are the features you need to know? Because in the books, they're going to talk about all these different terms and things you got to look for, and if, if you don't, kind of don't have a frame of reference, this will help you in kind of getting yourself oriented into the whole world of mushrooms. Um, this is a really interesting mushroom, uh, by the way, this particular one. This is Biospora myosurus, and you can tell it's on a Sitka spruce cone, which is about an inch and a half long, so they're little tiny guys. But what's really interesting about this mushroom is um, there's a compound that was isolated from this genus of mushrooms. The genus is called Bayospora, and it's called Bayosporins, and those Bayosporins are used um, as fungicides. So this fungus produces, this mushroom produces compounds that resist certain pathogenic fungi, and it's used in agriculture, like millions of tons of it. They now synthesize Bayosporins, and they spray it on certain crops to prevent uh, fungal diseases. Kind of interesting. Um, but most people think about this when they think about mushrooms. <laughs> so, when you start with identifying a mushroom, you've got to figure out which of the major groups of fungi it's in when you're looking at this particular mushroom. And there's two major groups of what we call fleshy fungi. This, these are the ones we identify as mushrooms or mushroom-like deals. Um, so the first group are called basidiomycetes, and that, that word basidium comes from the Latin and it means club, and this is like the business end of a mushroom. This is the cells that are in some place on the mushroom that produce spores, which are the reproductive structure of the mushroom, like the seeds of an apple tree, for example. So um, lining the gills of this mushroom or on the surface of this jelly fungus are all these basidium cells that produce millions and millions of these little spores that fly around through the air and reproduce the mushroom. So one major group of mushrooms are the basidiomycetes, which include you know, all the traditional mushrooms and these jelly fungi. Another group are the ascomycetes. Ascus is Latin for sac. And the spores are produced inside a sac, like this, usually eight spores. Here's a photomicrograph of that. And a little cap pops up and these spores get shot into the air. And the common groups of fungi that are ascomycetes are these flat things called discomycetes, and it's not like uh, John Travolta, you know, just kind of <laughs> um, But they're really pretty. This little one called the orange peel fungus is really common and that's actually edible. This is called the eyelash cup, Scutellinia scutellata. Great name. And people might be familiar with morels. They're not real common on the coast, but inland and all across the, the world. One of the best edible mushrooms in the world are uh, morels. Um, so, we want to look at, the first thing when you, when you figure out what basic group of 
fungi you're dealing with, is what is the shape of the spore-bearing surface of this mushroom or fungus, okay? So, major groups of mushrooms are based on, hey, oops, oops, based on the spore-bearing surface. So, most common are gills. They're flat, plate-like structures, and those flat, plate-like structures are lined with literally millions upon millions of these basidia, which are sticking out. So if this is the, the gill, there's the, these basidia that make the spores are sticking out this way. If you look at them on the microscope, you can see that. Um, so common are the gill mushrooms. Those are really common. So pretty obvious. You look at a mushroom, turn up, turn upside down, look at the business end of it, got gills. Okay, great. Another group might have pores or tubes. This is in a big group we call the boletes. Many of them are good edibles, including Boletus edulis, the king bolete, or Sepp, or Steinpilz if you're in Germany, or uh, anyway, lots of common names for this guy. Um, but what's really interesting about these guys is the, t the basidia are lining these little teeny tubes, little microscopic tubes. And you want to kind of make note of this, because if you take those tubes, you can kind of separate them. It's a little teeny like threads, but, they're, but if you look at them on a microscope, they're actually tubes. They're hollow. And we're going to contrast this with another group that might be confused with this group. Okay? So, some common uh, bowly type mushrooms. So, spongy surface underneath. And what's really interesting, a certain group of them, mostly in the genus Boletus, has this, it's called a reticulation or a netting at the top end of the stalk. And it's really common on Boletus edulis. But if you actually look at this under a microscope, you see that what they are is really wide and really shallow tubes. There's actually basidia, spore-bearing surfaces, inside those little netting things. So they're kind of like tubes that are running down the stalk that got really shallow and really big. Interesting. Um, Another type of spore-bearing surface would be spines, or teeth. So this is Dentina rapana, or the hedgehog fungus. Um, really common here, really good edible. Um, and by the way, uh, almost everything you see here you can see live upstairs. These all pictures are from this area here. Um, so the Dentina rapana, the hedgehog fungus, uh, Sarcodon imbricatum, which is also called hawk's wing, which is also a good edible, except Sometimes they're really bitter. It's like, you'll know right away. <laughs> so you wouldn't eat it. But they're really good. They're, and Herisium arenaceus, or the um, lion's mane, which is also grown commercially, a bunch of different species of that, has some medicinal properties, good edible, also grows wild here. And this is a really cute guy. This is called Oroscopia vulgari. And it's, it's like a little fuzzy thing with a bohawk haircut with spines on it, and it's this one, they grow on, on, only on cones, this is on a western white pine cone. Uh, so, remember the boletes back there with the tubes? Well, there's another group called the polypores, and they look like tubes, but rather than be individual tubes, what this is, it's like a solid material and somebody poked holes in it and then lined those holes with basidia. So if you break it apart, you'll have this solid context rather than a bunch of little thready tubes put together. So that's the difference between the boletes and the polypores. Now most of the polypores that you'll see out in the woods are these big horse hoof looking things. We call them artist conchs, things like that. They're really hard, they're woody, they're, they grow on, uh, always grow on wood. Um, they're primary decomposers and also many of them are pathogens. Um, that foresters don't like so much because they kill trees, but they also break down the wood. So it's interesting as we're looking at these <coughs> fungi to think about what's their role in the ecosystem. Um, mushrooms, or all these fungi we're looking at, are essentially the reproductive structure of a fungus. So most of the fungus is living in the substrate, in this case a tree, or on the ground in the soil. And what we're seeing is the reproductive structure, like an apple on an apple tree. So that's the analogy. So if you pick the fruiting structure, you're not killing the fungus, because most of the fungus is still in there. Now, 
Think about reproductive strategies. <coughs> Human beings, we produce one, two, five, ten, twelve offspring, right? In our lifetime. Here's this fungus, and somebody figured this out for a similar type of fungus, a polypore, some poor graduate student, counted the number of spores that this thing produces. And they took a big polypore on a tree and they figured it out. And it was producing five trillion spores an hour. So that's a lot of spores. They have a really low reproductive rate. So out of the five trillion spores an hour, maybe one or two over the lifetime will land on another tree, germinate, grow, degrade it. Now, if it wasn't for the fungi, we'd be up to our necks in, you know what, poop. They're, they're the primary decomposers of everything. So anything that's living or dead gets decomposed by a fungus. Then eventually the fungus dies and a bacteria decomposes that and it recycles into the environment. So the, without the fungi, everything would stop because nothing gets broken down. So they got to break things down. So uh, different kinds of polypores. Some are kind of mushroom-like. Like this, some are shelf like. This is Latipurus sulfurius, which is also an edible. It's called chicken of the woods. Uh, you got to be careful of common names because um, there's actually a number of different mushrooms that are called chicken of the woods. But this happens to be one of them. Um, so, another form, spore bearing service, are puffballs. Um, sometimes they get big, like this Calvation Gigantea, big, big guy. Um, little guys in the woods, like a Perdon Perlita, we see these guys. Uh, really interesting called, group called the Earth Stars. This is a, a sample of one of those. They're really neat. They're like a little, a little ball. And as they mature, it splits and it folds back and it makes these little wings. And the wings sort of elevate this little ball into the air. The rain comes down, it hits the surface of this ball, and it causes spores to puff out of that little hole and blow away. <laughs> really elaborate little feelies that they come up with. So puff balls, that's another group, spore bearing service. There's a really interesting group called stinkhorns. And they have lovely names like Mutinus caninus and Phallus induciatus and Phallus impudicus or aceroid and rubra. And what happens with these fungi is it produces this slimy matrix filled with spores, and they really do stink. I mean, you can usually find them, you can usually smell them before you see them. You're walking along, you smell something, and it's like, Ugh. And look down, and there's a stink horn. And they attract insects like flies that land on there and lap up this goop, and then they fly away and land someplace and spread the spores. Really common, um, these guys are really common like in gardens uh, and lawns and places like that when it's moist. Here's a really interesting stinkhorn called um, Clathrus rubra. It's about this big. This, this one doesn't grow here. This is actually in Florida, but they're really common. I mean, I walked out in this lawn, there's like 50 of these things growing out of the lawn. It's like, do the aliens land? <laughs> interesting fungi. Uh, another group are the coral fungi. And there's a bunch of those upstairs. Different, they come in all kinds of different colors. And on these, the spore bearing surface is basically all over the outside of these branches. They come in beautiful colors. Another group are called the bird's nest fungi. And these are little cups. They're maybe a quarter inch in diameter. And they're actually really common, but nobody sees them because you don't look for them. But if you get down on your hands and knees underneath the bushes and stuff and look on sticks, these things grow on the ground, they grow on sticks. Um, they like to grow on elk and deer poop. Um, and there's these little cups, and sometimes they're covered with a little cap. And then the cap comes out, and inside are these little egg-like things. We call them pretioles. And they're little packets of spores. And these cups are perfectly shaped like this. And a raindrop comes down falls into the cup and washes one of these little <coughs> perioles out of the cup. Now some of them have a long little string on them. And that little string is tailing behind. It's got a little sticky wad at the end. And it hits another stick and goes whoosh, 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 boom. <laughs> now you got this packet of spores on a fresh stick. It rains. The spores germinate. The 
grows, the fungus grows through the stick and makes more bird's nest fungi. They're really cute, and you ne people never see them. But I was just, um, about a month ago, I was walking outside on my driveway, and I looked down on the ground, and the ground is covered with about a thousand of these things. Just growing all over the place. It's like, what? So, uh, everything we saw <coughs> up to now in terms of spore bearing surface were basidiomycetes, or mushrooms, or mushroom allies. Now we're going to look at the cup fungi, or the ascomycetes. So, some common ones um, are morels, like this beautiful Morchella escalenta. This eyelash cup we saw before, Scutellinia scutellata. This is really common in mossy environments along streams, where it's really moist. So if you look along a stream bank, really common, you'll find this guy. Um, Calocyphofulgens is really interesting, another cup fungus. Um, and this one grows in snowbanks. As the snow melts, you'll see this thing fruit right along the edges of the snowbank. So you can follow the melting snow in the spring. Uh, what happens with these ascomycetes, or these cup fungi, is remember that those spores are produced in a sack. And the sack's got a little lid on it. It's called an operculum. And when the humidity changes to the right thing, right, particular humidity, that cap will pop off and the spores are under pressure and they get shot out into the air. <coughs> and you can change that by breathing on them. So you find a fresh one and you go, <sighs> they will puff like this. And you can see the oh, wow. little smoky, that's the spores being puffed out. So I was, leading a, I was leading a class last month in Rocky Mountain National Park and we found a whole bunch of these. And the whole class just sat down and they couldn't stop puffing on them and taking <laughs> pictures. <laughs> They're really fun. So here's another group of organisms. They're actually not fungi, but people who study fungi tend to study these guys. They're called slime molds. They're not related as fungi. They're completely unrelated. But people who study mushrooms tend to study these slime molds, which are really pretty. And slime molds are really interesting. It's kind of like they have two different life stages. One is this um, kind of acellular mass. It's just a mass of protoplasm that creeps along the substrate, absorbing nutrients, like an amoeba that just absorbs stuff. Um, it's called a plasmodium state. And then all of a sudden, something happens in the environment, and the fungus go, the slime mold goes, OK, time to prepare for you know, dry conditions or whatever. And they produce these little fruiting structures to make spores. And they come in different shapes and colors and sizes, and they're really beautiful. There's like about three or 400 species in the world. And some people have produced these gorgeous big portfolio books with these paintings of them. They're just they're crazy, beautiful things. Anyway, just kind of a little side light, but people who crawl around in the woods tend to find these things. So, OK. so. We talked about spore bearing surface. We talked about basidiomycetes and ascomycetes. We talked about the shape of the spore surface. So the next thing you need to know is where do they grow? Well, most common places in the forest. Well, why are we interested in where they grow? Most land plants, about 95% of all plants that live on land, have an obligate symbiotic relationship with fungi that live in the roots of the plants. That relationship between the fungus and the plant is called mycorrhizae. It's not a guy from Ireland, mycorrhiza. <laughs> but myco means fungus, rhiza means root, means fungus root. And what happened historically was before plants came on land from the ocean, there was fungi living on the land. The first plants encountered fungi, and they formed this symbiosis probably 400 million years ago when the first plants came along. And without this relationship, we wouldn't have plants. They just couldn't live. So most of these plants that have these mycorrhizal relationships, um, they're what we call obligate. In other words, without the fungus, the plant just, they would thrive. They would just die. Some are really like 100%, like orchids. 100% of orchids have mycorrhizae in the roots. No fungus, no orchid. They just won't grow. They'll just die immediately. Um, Others not so obligate. Some are very general. Now, remember, it's a fungus and a plant, but the fungi associated with the plants don't always produce mushrooms. Only a few of them do. Most of the mycorrhizal fungi 
that are associated with plants are in a group that are related to bread molds. You know that black stuff that grows like on, uh, you leave a pumpkin out after Halloween, cut, covered with black fuzz. They're called zygomycetes. Most of the fungi that do these mycorrhizal relationships are in that group. And the reproductive structures are microscopic and they're under the ground. So you never see them. But a number of them do, of these fungi, produce mushrooms, particularly the ones in the woods. And most forest trees, in fact, all of them, so the pine family, you know, pines, spruces, firs, dug firs, etc., larches, all have these mycorrhizal relationships with fungi that produce mushrooms. So that's why looking in the woods for mushrooms is a great place to look for them. Okay? Um, common, other common families that produce mycorrhizal relationships with mushroom producing fungi. So besides the pine family are the oak family, the beech family, the heather family, which is, uh, includes manzanita and uh, arbutus, um, um, madrone, okay? So those are the kind of plants or trees that you tend to find a lot of mushrooms. Another place might be out in fields or pastures. Uh, uh, so there's a whole group of fungi that, so these aren't mycorrhizal, they're what we call saprophytes. In other words, they're just uh, working on, on decayed matter like poop. Um, another place is urban areas, city parks, cities, disturbed areas, gardens. So there's a whole group of fungi you find in those kind of places. Or in rangeland or sage, sagebrush. So different kinds of habitats. The next thing we want to think about is what are they growing on? So within each habitat, there's things that they're growing on. Are they growing on the ground, like in the forest? Are they growing on wood? This is an interesting one, this little gallerina. Not something you would probably tend to eat because they're little small brown mushrooms. We call those the LBJs, little brown jobs. <laughs> um, this one happens to be deadly toxic. It has the same poisons as the deadly ammonitis. So these will kill you. And uh, not quickly either. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing to know. If you get poisoned by mushrooms, if you get sick like in an hour or two or three after you eat them and puking up your guts, whew, sigh, sigh of relief. You're probably going to be okay. You won't feel very good for a couple days, but you're not going to die. If you get sick eight hours later, get to the emergency room. That's, you got to start worrying. Because those are the, one of the symptoms of the really deadly poison mushrooms is they have a latency period of six to eight hours. Or in the case of one particular mushroom from Europe, up to six months. Yeah, you eat something, six months later you get sick, you don't associate it with that mushroom. It's a, it's a toxin called oralin. Bad news. Don't want to eat those. Um, growing on poop, growing on dung. Um, there's a whole group of fungi that grow on insect larvae or insect pupae or insects. They kind of gross. They kind of land on it. They infect the whole insect and they turn the whole thing into a host for this fungus. And this cordyceps, oops, um, is actually um, a. Uh, it's actually grown now commercially, and it's got a lot of medicinal properties, cordyceps does. Um, they grow it in, in Asia a lot. Ah, they could be growing on other mushrooms. So this is, this Hypomyces lactiflorum, it's called the lobster mushroom. We've got a bunch of them upstairs. It's a good edible, and they, they always parasitize other mushrooms. This, this guy, this Hypomyces, it's growing on this one, this, uh, the orange one and the green one, Hypomyces. <coughs> Uh, Luteovirens is actually an ascomycete growing out of acidiomycete. They're fighting it out. With this little cute guy, Asterophora parasitica. So different weird substrates. Uh, Colivia atreta grows on charcoal. So if you find a mushroom growing on charcoal, there's only a few. That's probably what it is. Or how about this guy, Scleroderma macrorhizon? Growing in a sand dune. And we have coastal dune forests here in Oregon, and this, this one occurs there. It's actually an inedible puffball, but it's a really interesting habitat. And there's really interesting fungi that grow in these, these dune forests along the coast. They're just in Northern California and Southern Oregon. is like one of the 
few places in the world that has that unique ecosystem. Ah, okay. So let's we're going to drop back now and look at the main group of mushrooms, the gilled mushrooms. So you got this, this fungus here, and it's got gills. The next thing you need to know is what color are the spores. That's really critical to identify it. You just got to know the color of the spores. Now, you can go to the trouble of making what we call a spore print. And these are all examples of spore prints of different colored spores of mushrooms. And the way you make a spore print is you take the mushroom, you cut off the cap. So you've got this cap. You set it down on a piece of paper. Now, ideally, you'd set it on a piece of, two pieces of paper, a piece of white paper and a piece of black paper together and put the cap right on the top. Then put a bowl over it to raise the humidity. Let it sit overnight, pick the bowl up, and you'll see a spore print. Now, you want white paper in case the spores are dark, and you want a dark paper in case the spores are white, if you don't know. If you know already, then you don't need to do that. And when you have a mature mushroom, you can pretty much guess the spore color by looking at it and seeing the gill color. Because typically, not always, but oftentimes the gills start out white, and they get colored by the spores, whatever color spores they are. Now, we'll, we'll see some examples as we go through the slides, but here's, um, obviously, these are white spores. Uh, these are purple-brown spores, so the common agaricus mushrooms you buy in the, in the supermarket, those are purple-brown spores. Mycologists have their own um, sense of color. We make up all these colors. <coughs> we have colors like clay brown, well, that's clay brown, or bright rusty brown. There's one species of mushrooms in the world that produces green spores. That's chlorophyll and moldites. It probably grows in your lawn. Um, and it's uh, poisonous, so you don't want to eat it. Um, but here's an example of some different colors of brown. Uh, these are actually pink spores, these guys here. So that gives you kind of a sense of the range of spore color. And like I said, sometimes you have to get some clues, because you'll look at this mushroom and um, maybe the gills start off being red or orange color, so you can't really tell what color the spores are. So if you look carefully, if there's like two mushrooms or more growing together, sometimes you'll have one here and one here. Pull this one back, you'll see a spore print on the cap of this one. Or sometimes you'll see on the stem, some spores have gathered on the stem and you can kind of see the colors if you look carefully. Um, and it's really helpful to have something like this. this is a, 10x ham lens, you can kind of get at any um, scientific supply, which are really handy when you're out in the field to look at, look at things. You can get in real close and look at what's going on. So once we figure out spore color, the next thing, oh, there's kind of a, a traditional idea of mushroom development, where they start off like a little egg, like this guy here, and then that cap expands and the stem elongates and that covering, like the egg, gets split. And in this case, it leaves some tissue at the bottom, call that a vulva, and some stuff on the top, which is patchy stuff. And then where that cap connected to the stem, or stipe, that's the science name for the stem, it's called stipe. Um, so where that cap, there was some tissue there, and that tissue got left as a little ring. So this is, happens to be Ammonita clyptoderma. Uh, it's called the Cocora. We've got a bunch of them upstairs. Big handsome mushrooms. Uh, really good animal. Um, so, next thing. Talk about how do those gills attach to the stem. Really important feature. And as you go through the books, they'll talk about gill attachment. And these are all different words that could be free. I mean, they don't really touch. And all these other different words. We'll look at a few examples so you get a sense of it. But when they talk about gill attachment, that's what they're talking about. What happens when that gill hits the stem? They could be free, like an Ammonite muscaria. So you turn this thing upside down, you look at the gills, and see where the stem goes into the cap. And there's this ring of tissue just kind of exposed there. So the gills don't quite hit that stem. Or they could just be attached, you just go boom, they could go running down the stem, you know, boom, all the way down. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on this one, but the genus Tricholoma are white-spored mushrooms, and they've got a little notch right before the stem. So here's the stem, 
come down and make a little notch and then go boom, like that. Um, here's a chanterelle, and you can see that in this case they're kind of running down the stem like that, or in this clytopolis, which is, anybody want to guess what color the spores are in this guy? Pink. You can sort of get the pinkish cast. But if you kind of turn it sideways, you, you kind of see the pinkish cast to it. Kind of hard to tell in the picture, but you kind of, after a while working with these things, you get, you get, start to get a sense of them. Um, so, what shape is that cap? So that's important. Is it? And they tend to be, well, they're environmentally variable in any mushroom as they grow up. They might start this way and then they kind of expand out like this. It's some, the majority of the specimens will have some particular shape. You know, common is convex, or it could be ovoid, or it could be depressed, or conical, or funnel shaped, or bell, or campanulate, or umbinate, it's got like a little mammary at the top there. Um, so, here's, here's a cylindric one. This is called Coprinus clematis, called the shaggy mane, or lawyer's wig, common edible mushroom, grows in waste places. Um, what's really interesting about this particular group of mushrooms, these have black spores, by the way. And if you look at the gills on this guy, they are literally so close together, you couldn't stick a piece of paper between the gills. So then you think, well, how do those spores going to get out of there? Well, this genus Coprinus, rather than rot, it turns into a, a mass of gooey, black, inky-like stuff, and it just drips away. And those droplets are full of spores, and they get dispersed, and that's how it spreads the fungus. So cylindric, caps. Uh, this is umbinate. It's got a little boop at the top here, a little umbo. Um, Ammonite muscaria. Everybody probably seen this guy around in the woods. It's got a hemispheric cap. Or this is conical and umbinate, so it's got a little <coughs> top little peak that's coming out of a relatively flat cap. This guy is depressed. Probably need some antidepressants. Uh, conical, little cone-shaped cap. So remember I talked about these mycorrhizal fungi, you know, the symbiotic with the roots of trees, really common in the pine family, so that's why our forests are a great place to collect mushrooms. But redwoods, the redwood family, the type of fungi that are associated with the roots of redwoods are microscopic zygomycetes. You can't see them. So redwood forest, in general, is not a really great place to collect mushrooms because the redwood trees are not mycorrhizal with mushrooms. But we do tend to find a lot of bright colored hygrosophy species in the redwood forest. They're not mycorrhizal mushrooms. They're saprophytic. They're breaking down the you know, the pine, the redwood leaves and things. But they're really common in redwood forests. Uh, so we're looking at cap shape again. Um, this this Cortinarius has almost like a cylindrical, spherical cap. Uh, this gomphus has like a funnel or tube shape. Um, this is sort of a bell-like shape, this annulus campanulatus, grown out of cow poop. It's really cute. It's got this little fringe of, of the edge. <laughs> and then we look at the shape of the stalk, or the stipe. Um, and they can have some different kinds of shapes, like club-shaped in our Boletus edulis, uh, equal. This happens to be Ammonite phylloides, which is uh, called the death angel. Um, Relatively common. I haven't seen any yet this year, but they're really common on the coast. They were introduced to this country. They came in on oak, with oak trees. They're mycorrhizal with oaks. Um, they are deadly poisonous. And most of the deadly poisonings in this country, at least, are from Ammonite phylloides, oftentimes with immigrants, um, particularly immigrants from Southeast Asia, who are used to collecting mushrooms. And in Southeast Asia, there are other species of Ammonita that are edible that look like are Ammonita phylloides. So, um, recommend against <coughs> eating any Ammonita species unless you absolutely know that they're edible. That it's just not worth the risk. And if you go upstairs, you'll see that Kokora, that's the one that I had that sequence with the egg to the big one. Um, that's a good edible Ammonita. 
But and if you see it, it's really distinctive. And if you learn the features, no problem. But um, so another shape of the stalk, like look at this rubra volitus sicanus with a bulbous base. I mean that's kind of obtuse. But this dendrocolivia racemosa, it has this long stem that kind of goes into the ground. And if you look really closely, these little guys sticking out are like little teeny mushrooms sticking out of the side of the, <coughs> of the stem. It's the only one like that. And that's actually common here. So where is that stipe located relative to the cap? Another important thing, OK? The most common is what we call central. In other words, it's right in the middle, right? Most common mushrooms are like that, right in the middle. Or this Trichomopsis, right in the middle, with this little Mycena. This is a really cute one. It grows on logs, and it um, uh, smells like bleach. <laughs> uh, so one of the things they talk about too much in, the, in this is the mushrooms have smells. Some of them have no smell, but many of them have a really distinctive odor. And it's going to be in important in identification. Like it smells like garlic. Erasmus scordonius is a common mushroom here, a little, little guy. And they smell like garlic. Now they're really small, so you really got to crunch up one and you really like stick it all the way up in your nose and smell it. So it, when mycologists smell mushrooms, they don't go like this. They go, <laughs> So you really got to smell the thing. And by the way, there's nothing that's so poisonous or toxic. I've eaten the amanitophyllates. I mean, I took it and I ate it. I knew what I was eating. Not, I didn't swallow it. I just wanted to taste it, and they spit it out. So there's no mushroom that's so toxic that it's going to hurt you by doing that. And there's a number of mushrooms you have to taste in order to identify. Because one of the features for certain groups of mushrooms is has a bitter or acrid taste, like or acrid over after two minutes. So you take this thing, you take a little bit, you chew it up on the tip of your tongue, you spit it out. Mm -hmm. Two minutes later, it's like, ah! <laughs> it's like I just ate a scotch bonnet, you know, like that. There's some of them that are really that hot. Um, so smell, taste, and as you, get, as you begin to identify these things into different groups, you know, some groups will tell you you've got to know the, the taste, some you've got to know the smell. <coughs> So I encourage you to get right in there with those things and, you know, get close up. So this one has an eccentric stipe. It's off to the side. Anybody guess what this uh, substrate this is grown on? It's a whisk broom, about three inches across. I found it in an old barn in northern Oregon. So those, guys, those mushrooms are really small. Um, Pleurotus. Oyster mushrooms. This was actually a growing culture. You can buy these kits to grow oyster mushrooms. So that's this is what we we'll call a lateral stipe. So it's kind of on the side. So here's the cap, and the stalk is on the side. And this guy's crepidotus um, have no no stem at all. It's just like this little cap that's just sort of attached onto a log, with no stem at all. So important to know where that stem is, or if it's even got one. So the next thing we want to look at is what's the <coughs> consistency of the mushroom. So if you go to kind of rip it apart, what's it like? So everybody's familiar with the common agaricus you buy in the store, the white mushrooms or cremini, which are a relative. And those are what we call fleshy fibrous, OK? They're, you rip them apart, they're kind of stringy a little bit, and they're sort of fleshy, firm. This is Catathalasma ventricosa, um, which we have a bunch of upstairs, great big horsey mushroom. I mean, I've seen these at like five pounds, one mushroom. Really robust. I mean, you could like club somebody with this thing. <laughs> tough guys. So that's the typical, what we call fleshy fibrous. There's a whole group uh, in the family called Rushulaceae, which is a Rushula and Lactariuses. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, where the texture of the stem and really the whole fungus is chalky, so you break it up and it just sort of breaks up into little crunchy little bits. Um, and if you look at under a microscope, all fungi are composed of these long filaments called hyphae. So the mushrooms are made up of these long filaments. Well, in the Rushula's family, those long filaments are interrupted by these round cells called spherocysts. 
what it does is it causes those things to just break apart like that. Um, the practical implication is the texture is not good when you go to cook them, to eat them. So most of the rushulas and lactariuses don't have a really great texture. Some of them are okay, but most of them don't. Um, cartilaginous, so these thin kind of, they look like cartilage sort of, and they're kind of pliable. Um, uh, they'll call that cartilaginous, and some of them are, are wiry. Little, little wiry guys, and you can kind of flip them with your hand and go <laughs> Little wiry guys. Um, and they might have what we call a partial veil or an annulus. Annulus means ring on the stem, and that's a really important feature to, to note. So like in Ammonita, you could have these big skirt-like veils hanging down. And remember, when this thing was young, that cap was sort of closed and it was connected to the stem with this tissue. And as it grew, that tissue broke away, and in this case, made this little ring hanging down the stem. Um, this agaricus, which goes in the woods, has a little flaring, sort of velvety, kind of or felty looking cup. Call that flocos. Or this one has a flaring pharynos, which means granular ring. It's just a dermophallax. Now, m most mushrooms don't have any ring, but when they do, you want to kind of note what it looks like, where it is, is it high, is it low, is it shaped like this, is it shaped like this. Or it could be slimy, or cobwebby-like. <coughs> so this is a really important feature. There's a group of mushrooms, the genus is called Quartinarius. Um, worldwide, something like 1,200 species have been described, and that's probably 1% of what's out there. Really complicated group of mushrooms. It includes that one, Quartinarius orolanus, with that latency period up to six months. So we recommend people don't eat any Cortinarius. <laughs> Although in Europe, many species are, are, are eaten, I'll just tell you. Uh, and there's a lot of them. We have hundreds and hundreds of Cortinarius species out here. Uh, they're very difficult to identify. But they all have one thing in common, and they've got this spider web like veil. It's called arachnoid, which means spider. Arachnoid partial veil. And in this case, you can see, in all three of these Quartinaria species, you can see deposits of the spores that have fallen and gotten trapped on that spider webby veil. So you can tell what color the spores are. By the way, my colleagues call this bright, rusty brown. <laughs> anyway, they're brown. But common Quartinarius. <coughs> and they're really interesting when you find them, because they can be big, they can be small. But they always have a cortina or, or this spider webby veil. Sometimes it's not hanging from the edge of the cap, it's just hanging on the stem and covered with spores. So you kind of have to figure that out. Um, so remember, some of those are in a cup when they start, particularly the genus Ammonita. And what happens to that cup as the mushroom grows? And it's left as some tissue at the base of the stem which is, produces like a cup or a vulva, and or warts or patches on the surface of the cap. So Amanita muscaria leaves these, they're called pyramidal warts, because if you look at them closely, each one looks like a little pyramid shape. Um, and then at the base, you've got this remains of this cup, and in this case it's called circumcisal, because it's a bunch of rings, circum, around. Now, when you're out in the woods and you see these mushrooms growing out of the ground, a lot of times people go, oh, there it is, and they grab it and pull it. Well, if you grab it and pull it, this structure from here down is going to get left in the soil. And then you take it home and you want to identify it, and the first thing it's going to ask you is, after they say what color are the spores, they're going to say, does it have a cup at the base? And you look and you go, no, no cup, but you're missing it. So it's really important if you're trying to identify something, a mushroom, you want to get down underneath the base of that stem and get that cup for identification purposes. So you want to make sure to get that. In this case, this is like a sack that's kind of like constricted, like somebody put a string around the middle here. Or this vulvar, vulvariella bombasina, 
Um, this is called a patty straw mushroom that's grown uh, commercially in the Orient. And it's grown on rice straw. Um, and it's really common in Japanese and Chinese restaurants. Um, anyway, it's got a big cup at the base here. Uh, this is the Amanita Caesarea, which we actually don't have in this country. It's from Europe. It's really pretty. It's got a really nice hold up. Uh, and then those warts on the top. So, like we said, in the Amanita Caesarea, a little pyramid shape. And this Amanita Clyptoderma leaves large patches. I've got some upstairs I collected yesterday where the patch covers the entire surface of the cap. Big, big caps. These things get the size of dinner plates, 12 inches across or so. They're yummy. <laughs> they really are good. So, there's a group of fungi. It's in the genus Lactarius, lact meaning milk. They're called the milky caps. And they all produce some sort of, we call it latex, but it's not latex like rubber, like from a rubber tree. It's just the name that somebody applied. But it's got this liquid that exudes out of it when you break the, the flesh, particularly if you break the cap flesh. And that latex can be different colors, like in this one, Lactarius chrysoreus, which means golden tears. It's gold. Or in Lactarius rufus, it can be white. This one's really hot. I mean, peppery hot. Uh, Lactarius deliciosus, uh, we have those upstairs. This one, it uh, bleeds an orange sap, or orange latex. Um, and then in some other ones, that orange latex can turn green after time or it can turn uh, red after time. So they all do all kinds of weird things. Lactarius indigo has blue latex. Okay, so we're out in the woods. We're going to collect mushrooms. We need some references. We need to know, you know, what books do we want to use? Well, here are some of the most common ones, uh, and what I consider the best ones for this area, by far is this new one mm -hmm. by Noah Siegel, who's here, uh, and he's speaking later today. Um, this, is, this book is a miracle. I've been collecting mushrooms on the North Coast for 45 years, and this reference is just ast astronomically better than anything else that's ever been produced. So, highly recommend it. Um, David Aurora's Mushrooms Demystified, uh, it's been out for a while, 30 years or so. Uh, pretty thick book, he's got thousands of species in it. Really good reference, he's got really good keys in it. So, the way keys work is, um, it's a really useful tool. So you open the key and it says, okay, it's a mushroom with gills. It's something else. Oh, gills, okay, great, go to number two. Then it says, what color are the spores? Are they white? Go to number three. Are they brown? Go to number four. So you just kind of, you got to make a choice. It's called a dichotomous key because you got to make a choice. Is it this or is it this? So you pick which one's the best and you kind of follow that. And then you get to the end and hopefully you got the right mushroom. <laughs> or not. And then you got to kind of back up and go, okay, where did I go wrong here? Oh, it's got brown spores, not white spores. Okay, let's go this way. Like that. Yes? I just wanted, while you have that up on the screen, that the middle book that you just said is the best thing since sliced bread for mushroom lovers. He's the keynote speaker today, Noah yeah. Siegel, at 2 o'clock. Right, yes. And he also has his books for sale upstairs. Yeah, they're for sale upstairs. Highly recommend that. I just took a class last year that's based on that book, and it couldn't be better. Yeah. So, uh, and, and literally, if you go on Amazon, there are thousands of mushroom books. Um, it's always better to start with something that's referenced around your geographic area, uh, rather than far afield. So, uh, you know, this one obviously is for our immediate area. Uh, David Aurora is, is from Santa Cruz, and so it's sort of centered around the West Coast, basically California, Oregon, uh, Washington. Uh, Field Guide is okay. This is an older book that was our kind of standard uh, when it was first written 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, this is another new book, which is really good, uh, by Dennis Desjardins, who's the mycologist at San Francisco State University. Um, that's a, a, a good reference book. Um, some older ones and some more general ones uh, that you might run across. Uh, particularly the Audubon Society book has some really good pictures. Um, that's by Gary Linkoff. Um, but this is the one. Get this one. <laughs> and so I'm from Colorado. 
for the last 25 years. And so we have, you know, we have a number of books for Colorado that are really, really useful. You'll find, you know, the most common species. So any place you go in the country, you're going to have a different groups of mushrooms growing. And you really want to get a book that's kind of associated with your area, if, if there is one available. Excuse me. So like in the Southern Oregon Rogue Valley, the mm -hmm. Redwood Coast would be... Um, yeah, it's going to cover most of what you're going to find. Is it? it yeah. The, there's going to be some some things that are, are going to be a little bit different. But you're going to have a real good start with this one. Um, this might be a good backup and or this one here. Um, either of those are good. And, and oftentimes local uh, mushroom clubs will produce their own little guides to their immediate areas. I know there's a, a club in Eugene that's pretty active uh, that might have stuff for Central Oregon. Um, but it really sort of regional you're going to do pretty well with, with any of those. Questions? I know I said a lot. I, I, I just love mushrooms. <laughs> I've been doing this for 45 years, and you know, I took a mushroom class when I was a freshman in college, and I was hooked. That was it. That was it for me. So I got out of it as a profession, but I do it as a it's my avocation now. And, um, I'm on the board of directors of the Colorado Mycological Society in Denver, and we've got about 550 members now, so we're pretty active, and we have a lot of. But we have a really short mushroom season in Colorado. So three days ago, I got up at my house, um, and it was 11 below zero. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of mushrooms right now. So we have a really short season. We got some stuff in the spring, like April, May, June. And then July and August is basically our mushroom season for most of the state of Colorado and areas. So this is a real pleasure to be out here and kind of be back home for me to see all the mushrooms. I got out of my car yesterday. I was driving from Medford, and I got... Over the, I was on 299, and I got off the, uh, said, welcome, welcome to California. And I literally pulled over, walked in the woods, and it was like a bazillion mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> welcome to California. <laughs> um, yeah? Have you ever done anything with mushrooms on the production end? Very little. Very little. I've tried it just to grow some to know that I could do it, you know, back when, but... It's kind of a different world growing mushrooms, and there's some folks upstairs. Um, they've got a, a commercial thing where they can you can buy kits for growing mushrooms on logs and sawdust and stuff like that. There's a lot of resources out there available. I'm more interested in stuff growing in the wild. What's your favorite mushroom? Or a couple of your favorites? Uh, Matsutake is my favorite mushroom. <laughs> Now known as Tricholoma muralinum. It's the name has changed a bunch of times. Are anybody here familiar with Mazataki mushrooms? They're yummy. But most of them that get collected commercially on the West Coast get sent straight to Japan where they sell for a hundred dollars a pound. They're they're really yummy. Um, interesting story about that mushroom, about um, the Mazataki mushroom. It was first described in Norway in nineteen oh seven, I believe. And the Norwegian mycologist that collected it thought it smelled like old gym socks. And he, and he named it Tricholoma nauseosum. Well, five years later, a Japanese mycologist described it and called it Tricholoma matsutake. But according to the rules of botany, and mycology comes under botany, even though mushrooms are not plants, um, according to the rules of botany, the first name is the name. If somebody names it later, too bad. Well, the Japanese had a fit. They said, we can't have our national mushroom be called nauseoso. So they made this plea to the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, and they agreed to change it to Trichloma matsutake. Well, there's, just in the last few years, a number of different species have been described. Um, they kind of describe, split them off based on the cap color. Some are brown. Uh, farther south, like in southern Colorado and New Mexico, they're kind of a brown cap. Um, some have a whiter cap like we have here, which is called Muralanum. You'll also see the name Tricholoma magnavillari um, or Tricholoma caligata. Anyway, they're all called Matsutake and they're all yummy to eat. <laughs> that's the important thing. So that's my favorite one among 
ones to eat and, and smell. You gotta smell them. If you haven't smelled a Matsutake, they're upstairs, there's some fresh ones, and really give it a good whiff. It smells like cinnamon and Matsutake. <laughs> Old gym socks. No, <laughs> not really. Do all the Matsutakes have that cinnamon smell? Yeah, if it's a Matsutake, it's gonna have that smell, period. That, that, so that's a really great example of where smell comes in really importantly. Because you could collect Catathalasma ventricosa, which has all the features of a Matsutake in terms of its shape and size, and even though they tend to be bigger. Um, but it doesn't have that smell. It smells like cucumbers. <laughs> and Matsutake smells like Matsutake. Once you smell it, you won't forget it. There's nothing that smells like it, except that. <laughs> Matsutake versus the amanita. Uh -huh. the, the stalk is real hard on the Matsutake. Yeah, amanitas are mostly tend to be relatively fragile mushrooms. Yeah. Um, on the larger amanitas, the stalks are always hollow. You cut them in half, and you'll see they're it's, they're they're really hollow in the middle. Um, and important, amanitas always have a cup at the base. There's no cup in you know, Matsutake. They also um, have free gills. Ammonitis have free gills. So if you look at where the stem hits the cap, and you turn it over, in ammonite there'll be a ring of free tissue. Not, not in, not in the Matsutake. They're in the Tricholoma genus, and they're going to have attached gills or notch gills. But once you get that smell, you'll never, ever, 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 <laughs> ever <laughs> mistaken. <laughs> Uh, so I want to say a few things about edibility. Um, we say that in terms of rules of thumb, there are no rules of thumb. So the really only certain way to know if a mushroom is edible is to be able to identify it to species and somebody else has safely eaten it in the past. And it's, while you can attempt to do that with a book, it's way more useful to actually be with another human being who knows that mushroom and can say, this is that. Because people will make some really silly mistakes. Like there's this thing called a false chanterelle, Hygrophoropsis orontiacus. Now, if you key it out using a book, you might confuse the two. But if you saw the two mushrooms next to each other, you would never in a million years confuse them, ever. That's why it's really important that if you're going to be interested in edibles, join a group like the Wild Rivers Mushroom Club and you know, get with other people that, that know them and learn that way so you get hands-on experience. Thanks so much, John. We've got another lecture okay. coming in in a few minutes. Let's give John a great